Oh man, welcome to the Wild West, everyone. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about, the expansion of the West. Alan, um, should be a really fun conversation. Are you ready for it? Uh, yes, I am. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got... Uh... I've got my book right here. I got it ready to go. Um, speaking of books, I did want to mention something real quick to you. You remember last week we discussed uh, Finland and the, uh, um, you know, the Russian Revolution and the Civil. I, I knew I had something on that very subject, and I wanted to bring it up. Uh, this is called uh, Finland and the Russian Revolution, 1917. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Um, if you get, if you can find this, because this is a very hard book to locate, at least uh, the, the hardcover edition, uh, by uh, C. J. Smith Jr. Finland and the Russian Revolution. So this will answer all your questions about how badass was Finland during the. They, we already know they were badass in thirty nine and forty, and you know the years after that. So, but there you go. I will keep my eyes open for that book. That's, that's, that sounds pretty cool. Um, looking forward to it. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you um, you may end up noticing uh, the dogs running around. I am taking care of my cousin's dog uh, this weekend. So, yes, Alan, you've already you've already seen it. Uh, they're they're doing well. They're just laying down, waiting for me to get finished. Um, so, Madison has always been really good. This dog is uh, doing fine too. So. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet, subscribe to our show wherever you're listening on YouTube. Yeah, go right ahead. Click uh, subscribe and then click the bell. And then if you like this video, uh, like it and then comment. And if you're only listening on audio, give us a subscribe, leave us a rating and a review. Tell your friends and family, your loved ones, uh, your mistresses. What would a... Mis what would, mistresses? What's the mail... Yeah, what's the male version of the mistress? What what's the male part? Yeah, what's the male version of the the mistress? <laughs> there you go. All right, so <laughs> tell those <laughs> tell those people too. Uh, yeah, do us a favor and subscribe and let people know. Um, yeah, that that's pretty much it. I wanted to get your take on the Tucker Carlson situation uh, real quick. Wow. Okay. The Tucker Carlson, um, something, something is going on. Oh, I mean, we've had this discussion on numerous occasions, but you know, they went after Bill O'Reilly. They went after Tucker Carlson, the uh, Andrew Tate, they went after Andrew Tate and they arrested him for what? I think he's been arrested and, uh, I don't think there have even been any real charges. Um, they're, I mean, they're going, they're, they go after Joe Rogan. They go after uh, Donald Trump. They go after, you know, all these. Jordan Peterson. Uh, they, uh, what's Bill Maher? They're, they're trying to cancel Bill Maher. They're trying to Elon cancel. Elon Musk. Hmm? Yeah. Elon well, Musk, I mean, Jordan Peterson, those guys. I, you know, I, I, we, you and I, we've discussed the shadow banning aspect. And, you know, there, there are some things that I have noticed. And there's no way, there is absolutely no way that that you could refute the things that I have seen, especially where when we link our YouTube page to, let's say, Facebook, the any interaction stops immediately. And it, I mean, completely. It's like everything else, there will be interactions with some of our uh, friends. But as soon as we put that uh, link, boom, gone. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So, um, yeah, there, there is... You know, and you know, and I remember, I remember when Rush Limbaugh was on the air. There was already a prior to him being a dissenting voice. There was already a monopoly on ABC, NBC, CBS, um, you know, CNN, and and even radio didn't. There, there really wasn't any talk radio. But but as soon as as soon as he came onto the radio, immediately there was. The uh, I think they called it the fairness doctrine. They were like insisting we need a fairness doctrine. Okay, okay well, why didn't y'all have a fairness doctrine on TV when you had a monopoly? Now that there's a dissenting voice, you're demanding that. And you had uh, even with the Fox News when Fox News came out, there was demands that um, you know I, Crossfire I think was the only station that had um, a, a conservative voice on CNN. Um, so. You know, it for me, 
what was what was that one um that, that parlor parlor was a dissenting voice and it was shut down by i think it was amazon so th there is a concerted effort i think and I, I don't know the whole story of why tecca carlson was removed but um but i i think this has something to do with the fact that he has spoken out against you know certain entities whether it's in the American government, whether it's with the U UN, uh, these other societies, the World Economic Forum, y you can't deny it and sit there and say, oh, that's just a conspiracy. There's just way too much smoke coming from the gun. So there you go. That's that's my uh, that's my thought. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And people may think like people know that if they listen to this show, they know that you and I are sort of center right conservative. Um, I don't like Fox. I don't like any mainstream outlet, so let's just put it out there. But I, I don't like Fox. I do like Tucker Carlson because he would go after the left and the right. Um, I remember you had, he went after Bolton. Uh, you remember the guy Bolton who was uh, like Trump's? Yeah, John Bolton. He had the, Yeah, John Bolton. That guy, the one with the thick he mustache, freaking... that guy wanted us to get into any war. You know, I, I liked him. I liked him. You know, I, all right. Well, when, let when, me finish. When if you Bush, don't mind, if, huh? can I finish? Can I finish what I was going to say? If you don't mind, is that all right with you? Well, I don't. Anyways, want, I don't. You know so how I am. I don't want to lose my thoughts. So yeah. Well, at the sake of Go losing ahead. my hey, thought, you asked me if I knew who he was. If, yes, I do know who Bolton was. He wanted us to go to war with Iran. Right. I didn't need his biography. So I mean, he went after John Bolton, who was obviously very. Um, he's a hawk. Um, for, for the right. He went after the chick who was like the attorney for, uh, Trump and everything. He, but so that's on the, that's on the right. He also went after everybody on, on the left too, went after the, the pharmaceutical companies. And that's the thing is, as I posted that I think he was the last honest voice on mainstream, which is why he was head and shoulders above everybody else. Like there was nobody, he was the king for a long period of time and because people people trusted what he had to say i'm not saying that he was always telling the truth um because well you know it's freak it's still mainstream it's still fox but i think people felt like they were getting he was a dissenting voice whether that was a, a dissenter um from like the left or a dissenter even within his own group, the conservative uh, right. So I think it's a shame that, that he's gone, but I am I am looking forward to seeing what happens from this. What will be the fallout? Will he start his own you know publication? Will he join you know an independent publication of some kind? I think that remains to be seen. But I think, and we I bring this up because I think this is going to have some historical significance moving forward. Uh, because I don't think Bill, you mentioned Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly. Yes, but he was already up in age. Tucker Carlson is our age, right? He's probably, you know, I'm 41. You're what? 50. Well, he's closer to your age probably, but anyways. I'm, I'm in my forties. Yeah. You're in your forties. Um, I just think that, uh, is anyone buying that? You think, uh... No, maybe. I mean, you look great. You look great. You look young. I, I think we're eating up too much time. But anyways, I just wanted to to get your take on that. And but I do think that that's that's an important moment that's happening right now within the sphere of journalism and mass communication. So we'll we'll see what happens from there. I was going to give you a, a rundown on my 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 flea bag story, but I'm going to skip it because I feel like I've just rambled on and you've rambled on and we've rambled on. Enough to bring in our guest. What do you think? Good Led Zeppelin song. But I, I did want to mention real quick that um, it kind of reminds me, this conversation reminds me of the movie Braveheart, where Robert the Bruce told uh, uh, William Wallace, you piss off the uh, Scottish nobles, you piss off the English king, you're going to be crushed from both sides. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually very, um, that's an apt statement. Yeah, very good. I like that. Thank you. Way to br Way to bring it together. Man. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, our guest is Elliot West. He is the, well, he, he is the alumni distinguished professor of history emeritus uh, at the University of Arkansas out in Fayetteville. 
Now he retired a, a year ago, so I think he's still like considered like emeritus. I think is sort of, you know, an honor that you're you're given, um, even though you're not teaching anymore. So, anyways, he's the author of several works, uh, including the Last Indian War, the Nez Perce story, the Contested Plains, Indians, Gold Seekers, and the Rush to Colorado, which won the Francis Parkman Prize and the Penn Center Award, and his latest book, which we are going to discuss. Continental Reckoning, the American West in the Age of Expansion. I Yes, I read the entire book, and it is a fantastic read. Looking forward to talking to Mr. West. It's going to be a lot of fun. He is a legend in the historical world of the expansion of the West. So it's, a, it's an honor to have him on the show. Alan, are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. I have my book here. Um... Got it right. I almost grabbed the Finland book. So, yep. All right, I'm ready to go. I do have a, uh, I do have a question, which may, hopefully, not get uncomfortable. But you know, yeah. Hey, listen. You know, we 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 gotta tell it like it is. But we'll do it in a very respectful manner. I overall loved this book. So, but but just had a, a question or two that I wanted to ask him. So, you know, hey, listen, I love The Walking Dead and Star Wars, but there's some parts I'm like, why did you do that? Anyway, yeah. please proceed. Well, here's the thing. With the expansion, the Western expansion, this is a touchy subject. So, obviously, it's going to be some some hard conversations. It's, it, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, we know what happened. You know, slavery, civil war, Indian wars, all that jazz. Um, we're going to get right down to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Elliot West is on the line. Elliot, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. How about you? I am doing fine. I trust the same for Alan. Alan, are you, uh, how are you? I am doing wonderful. You know, back is hurting a little bit. Um, you know, woke up sleeping wrong, but, you know, we'll talk about that later on. That's not... I don't think Elliot came here to discuss that. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, probably not. And I assume uh, that means that you're not doing as well as you purport to do. Uh, Elliot, your your book, Continental Reckoning. Um, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very thick book. And I did, I did, as I, as I said before, uh, before recording, I read all of it. Um, and for as, as thick as it is, it is an easy read. Um, it's a it's a beautifully written book, and I can't wait to. I had so many things, so many notes on here, so many questions to ask, and unfortunately, we can only ask so many uh, because we don't. This is not a twenty four hour long uh, podcast episode. Um, but I do want to start with more or less the beginning of where you start with Continental Reckoning, which is more or less your post-Mexican-American War gold rush moment. Um, so we've got the annexation of Texas, acquisition of the Oregon Territory, and the overwhelming victory in the Mexican-American War, which increases the size of the country by, you know, I think as you had mentioned in your book, by, by nearly half. Like we've got almost a, a you call it a new country, uh, which I thought was very, very apt to put it that way. Um, and then there is the gold rush combined with the land rush. So as you mentioned in your book, the new half of the country had no formal government. So what I ended up, while I was reading it, I just pictured this like pent up waters being held back and then just flooding the continent uh, with nothing there to stop people from coming across. And you... You approach the chaos that, from my perspective, was inevitable to ensue. Was chaos inevitable with how fast the expansion took place? Historians are also always reluctant to say inevitable, but what was uh, we're pretty close to it right here. I think you mentioned the gold rush. I think it's, what's critical to understand here is that uh, James Marshall, this uh, New Jersey carpenter who had immigrated to California, uh, to help build a mill uh, on the land of uh, John Sutter, uh, found gold, found that first fleck of gold in the American River, uh, just about 200 hours, 200 hours before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was, was signed. So the, so the point here is that uh, at the very moment that we acquire 
the Mexican session and specifically California, we began to realize that we have just acquired arguably the richest place on earth, you know, and it's this, it, it's on the far edge of this new expanded country. So what that did was uh, immediately uh, begin uh, this, this, this great flooding, you must use the uh, metaphor of a flood of, uh, you know, a water flood. It's, it's, it's like that. Yeah. And it's uh, it washes across the country into this place. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, there's all of this pressure to somehow connect California more, more reliably to the rest of the nation. So what this, what I call the great coincidence, the simultaneous acquisition of the far west, uh, expansion of the United States to the Pacific Coast with this uh, discovery of what, was, what at the time was far and away the greatest gold rush in human history at that time. Those two things together triggered these extraordinary changes and set in motion these events that I think uh, no one really could have stopped. And speaking of no one stopping, um, as you as you state in the book, like almost law and government, I want to say law and order, but law and government was trying to catch up. But with how things transpired so quickly and over such a vast landscape, and it's it's interesting. Um, we've had a historian on the on the show, Dr. Stephen Harden. Uh, who more or less specializes in Texas history, but he was saying 20 years after, or it's like 20 years after the Mexican-American War ended, there were still people, Mexicans, who thought that Spain was still running Mexico. So you've had, like, word was slow to spread. We, we You addressed the, the telegraph, but law and order was very behind the expansion and people will often say, well, you know, the old West movies where it's, you know, you're getting lining up in the street and you're having your, your standoffs and it's, you know, it's ultra violent. Like that's not really how it was, but reading your book, I'm like, no, that seems to be exactly how it was. It reminded me a lot of the old West movies. Here's a three three-pronged question you can address it however you want was the expansion of the west bloodier than it should have been as bloody as could be expected or could it have been worse well i suppose it always could have been worse but uh sure it was extraordinarily violent and i think uh we need to remember that most of the violence uh, was not so much interpersonal although i argue in there in fact that there it was more violent in terms of just the rate of homicide, for example, it, it was higher than the rest of the country. But the great violence uh, was uh, was elsewhere, in particular, of course, toward uh, Indian peoples, toward toward, uh, toward Native peoples. Uh, again, looking back, the acquisition of California coincident with the discovery of gold set loose what is uh, one of the clearest, most obvious, uh, most uh, a genuine case of genocide. It's a it's a term that people th throw around too much nowadays, I think. But in California, that was the real deal. Uh, it was a concerted effort by the government of California and by others to simply wipe out Native peoples. Uh, so you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred thousand uh, died uh, through direct violence, uh, through just total destruction of their economy, uh, toward a, a destruction of the family unit, for example. So that's where the violence was. Uh, Toward, uh, toward toward native peoples, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, expulsion of others, uh, non uh, non U.S. people out of there, um, and then and then that violence then spreads to the interior, uh, from uh, from California. Also, uh, Indian non Indian violence uh, was was uh, was in, was increased by this, uh, uh, the enslavement sort of de facto enslavement of uh, of his Hispanic people. In the Southwest, increases because of expansion. So it's a, you know, in many ways, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty disturbing story. Uh, violence is absolutely uh, critical to it, uh, and that's as you say, it's in part because, uh, and, and really, when you think about it, how else could it have been otherwise? Uh, when you acquire that much land, important to remember that much different land. The American West, of course, is fundamentally is fundamentally geographically, culturally uh, different from the East. Uh, it's it's very difficult, you know, to to establish control over it. It's a, it's a very because so many people are crowding into it, moving ahead of government, you know, and establishing it. So it's it's a 
in many cases, a, a case of something close to chaos. Well, okay, so I wanted to ask you about some of the violence, um, and I want to ask you about the expansion. Um, did private enterprise contribute to the expansion as well as the combination of uh, private and public lands? And on the violent aspect, um, I, I've heard, uh, it was Robert Utley mentions that the Civil War, what the soldiers witnessed, what they went through, made it easier for them to just... You know, you know, if you watch some mobster movies, they always say that that first kill is the hardest. But by the third or fourth, it, it's, it's nothing. And, you know, and Robert Utley alluded to the Civil War doing that to the, uh, to the soldiers, and that's what led to such violence. Um, yeah. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the private enterprise contributing to the expansion and the Civil War contributing mm -hmm. to the violence? Yeah, I think... Uh, I think uh... Bob Utley, my old friend, we lost, of course, uh, this, this during this past year. Excellent, very fine story. Uh, he's right on that. Uh, he's not the first to say that. Uh, uh, Richard Maxwell Brown at the uh, University of Oregon made that argument um, qu quite a while back. And I think there's definitely something to it. I think more of the point here is the fact, I, I try to emphasize this in the book, that uh, because of, especially because of the, there's this technological revolution of movement, what you find in the West in, in stark contrast with earlier frontiers, it is it's very heavily male. Uh, the percentage of, of the male adult male population in the West is far higher than it is in the rest of the country. Uh, and uh, you know, in, in, the, in the history of the world, most violence, most homicide is, uh, are, are committed by uh, male on male. So when you've got this huge percentage of a male population, when they're young, uh, when there's a lot of uh, firearms out there, when there's a lot of whiskey and liquor out there, uh, that's going to happen. And so, uh, yes, the rate of homicide in the West was uh, considerably higher in many cases than, uh, than that of the East. Uh, there are various reasons to it, but I think uh, Bob Utley and Dick Brown were, were correct that the Civil War the Civil War had its effect. It sort of numbs people, you know, to the uh, to uh, to homicidal violence. Now, what about the you know the the private you know private enterprise? Uh, you mentioned uh, about the telegraphs, where the uh, I think the difference between the American version of the tele uh, the telegraph versus the foreign was you know uh, private enterprise. So you know how much how much did that contribute? As well as uh, you know, what about the Homestead Act of uh, 1862? Um, you know, the abu was was it abused? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? The first first point here is that uh, our image of the West, our popular image of the West, of course, is one of uh, of, of great individualism, of uh, uh, self reliance, and so forth. All of that is true. Uh, I don't mean to denigrate that at all. But what I try to stress in the book is that this that the birth of the West takes place coincident also with the expansion of corporate power in this nation, the expansion of industrialism in this, in this nation. And as a result of this, the, the emerging West, the West that, was, that appeared between roughly 1850 and 1880, was one of the most uh, highly corporatized businesses, uh, uh, areas uh, on earth, really. Uh, it's really uh, characterized as, at least as much by big business and corporate power uh, than, it is, uh, than it is by sort of individual effort. That was true there as well. Uh, but for example, ranching, whether we're talking about Texas, where you are, or in the, in the Great Plains or in the Pacific Coast, uh, ranching uh, was one of the most highly corporatized uh, businesses uh, in the country. Uh, mining, of course, uh, was as well. So. Uh, that I think characterizes the West as much as this, uh, the idea of individualism. Um, the Homestead Act uh, certainly uh, uh, was a great opportunity for individuals, including women. Uh, ten, about 10% 10 of the homesteads taken up in the, on the Great Plains were, were taken up by single or, or widow uh, women. Uh, you ask about whether the uh, Homestead Act was, uh, was abused, uh, you bet it was. Uh, a lot of it was taken up honestly. Uh, Recent research has emphasized that it was not nearly as corrupt as we thought it as we have thought it was, but but absolutely, uh, the law was phrased in a way that allowed for a lot of uh, a lot of uh, speculation to take place, a lot of abuse of it, a lot of uh, um, uh, the use of the use of the Homestead Act for things that it was never intended for. 
It's a very complex uh, story behind homesteading, but um, it included that as well, as well as individualism, as well as the sort of the image that we have of hardworking families um, sort of starting out and, and establishing a place of, the, of their own. You talked about sort of the rise of, of corporations, corporate America. Um, and I think probably the first that people would think about would be like somebody like Vanderbilt, uh, Commodore Vanderbilt. But the railroads, how, how just, just, how did the railroads affect the expansion of the West? We know like off the top, like you could give us more detail off the top. It's like, yeah, it played a massive role, but give us some details on how big of a role the, the building of the railroads played. I think there are a few important points uh, to make on that. Uh, First place is uh, to follow up on the point I just made. Uh, railroads were arguably the most powerful corporations uh, in the country at that time. Uh, and you got to remember, while th- these, this is a private enterprise, as, as was the telegraph, these were private enterprises that were supported uh, by, by the federal government. You know, they, they, the, the transcontinentals were, were created through massive loans and massive gifts of land uh, to, the fe- to the federal government. Uh, the amount of land the amount of land that the federal government gave to transcontinental railroads to help them finance it. If you added all that together, if you added all that together, uh, the historian Richard White has, has pointed out that it would be the third largest state in the union. Yeah. You know, after after uh, Alaska and Texas, uh, then what he called a railroadiana, you know, this huge gifts of land uh, to the uh, to the railroads. Uh, it's a second point to, to, uh, to emphasize is that at the time the first transcontinental was built, you know, it was completed in 1869, uh, there was really uh, very little use for it, 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 it through most of the country that it crossed. Uh, most of the business was at either end. And when you look closely at it, you, you begin to increasingly to get the idea that this was really an incredible boondog. It was a way in which the, uh, the finance, the financiers and the uh, construction of the railroad uh, was a way of making enormous profits, enormous um, income uh, for the people who were behind it. However, once, as, as time began to pass, uh, the railroads had an, had an extraordinary impact on the development of this area between uh, the Missouri Mississippi Valley on the east and California and Oregon and the Pacific Coast in the west, filling in that area there. Uh, I think of Use a matter of, of, of sort of a web. You know, it, it's this increasing, this this growing dense, uh, dense web of steel and copper in the in the uh, in transcontinental uh, in, in the um, uh, telegraph that are kind of weaving together across the interior of the West and then binding them together and binding them to the rest of the country and to the rest of the world. Uh, so its eventual impact is enormous. It's very difficult, really, to uh, to overestimate, including, of course. The, uh, the military defeat of resistance of native peoples. Uh, the railroad and the telegraph are absolutely critical for that. Uh, William Sherman, no less than uh, uh, William Sherman uh, famously said that while the army had its role, it was the railroad really that defeated the Indian. You mentioned the railroad and you mentioned, uh, you know, the in- industrial revolution or the Gilded Age that, that the United States was going through during this time. Um, so the question I'm going to have, and what I'm about to say is going to be controversial, but, and I got into a fight with a few people over the statement that I made, which was when the, uh, when the West showed up on what is today the United States, the uh, Native Americans were still living in the Stone Age. And that pissed off a lot of people. And I said, I said, that is the absolute truth. They did not have industries. They did not have the ironworks that, uh, you know, that the West eventually, you know, we had the gunpowder. We had, you know. So here we have the westward expansion where you have a clash. And I I want to get your opinion on this. I, I feel that there was going to be an inevitable clash of civilizations because you have, I mean, even throughout the rest of the world, you had the old method of hunter gatherers, which were replaced by civilization in most parts of most parts of the world and definitely what in what you would call the West today. Um, But then you also have an economist by the name of uh, Joseph, uh, I hope I'm 
pronouncing his name correctly, Joseph Schumpeter, who coined the phrase creative destruction, which is the theory that a, a free market capitalist economy will destroy the old method and but replace it with something that's new and improved. So will you what's your thoughts on the Westford expansion? Would you categorize it as not only creative destruction, but a clash between the old hunter-gatherer versus civilization, which which we enjoy today because you know I can drive now from here to Florida and there are bridges that you know, cross over rivers, which were not there prior to westward expansion. So what, what are your thoughts on all that? Well, it's a, uh, it's, obviously, it's a complicated uh, question with complicated answers. Uh, and one that, as you, as you discovered, you can quickly get into trouble about. Um, I think we need to be very, very careful uh, in using uh, terms like Stone Age. You're, you're right, of course. And these were, uh, you know, native peoples in the West were pre-metallurgical. In that sense, they didn't have the sort of the, the, the uh, metal technologies uh, that the that the nation had that Western Europe had. Uh, so yes, technically, of course, that makes. But you know, our, our the the popular image of Stone Age means people sort of walking around their knuckles and are incredibly backward and so forth. We need to be careful also about civilization. Uh, Native Americans had civilization. They had their civilization, highly sophisticated uh, economies on their, working in their own ways. They were beautifully adapted to where they were living. Uh, they were highly adaptive. You know, uh, for example, the, the arrival of the horse triggered this revolutionary developments among Indian peoples with the coming, uh, you know, with, with, with the arrival of Europeans. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. The technology of the United States will, had, gave them an overwhelming advantage uh, in, in, in controlling uh, and militarily defeating uh, Indian peoples, as did numbers, of course. You know, we're talking about a, 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 a huge uh, and rapidly expanding population, numbers of populations in the East. Uh, you know, that as much as anything describes what's going on here. Uh, so uh, I think basically the question you're asking are, are we better off because of this? Uh, well, um, I, guess it's a, I guess it's a toss up. I think what we got to, uh, obviously, you know, we have bridges across rivers. Obviously we have, we have uh, you know, the internet. We have all these things that we, that we enjoy that were not there before. And they were products of this, uh, of this uh, new and revolutionary uh, technologies. But I think we always, whether we're talking about this or any aspect of history, you got to recognize that, that these sorts of sweeping changes that we saw in the emergence of the West always, always have downsides, always have destruction. Or in this case, creative destruction, as Schumpeter uh, called it, uh, results in this destruction of, of cultures, uh, results in massive population loss of these people who have been living here for millennia. Uh, also, and I think we can't we dare not overlook this, the environmental destruction uh, because of this rapid change and because of technologies like uh, mining, uh, technologies like modern ranching, technologies like the mod modern agriculture, uh, the environmental destruction of this causes was, uh, was really unprecedented in American history before that uh, and after that. So it's always, you know, it's, it's always a balance sheet, Alan. Uh, Sure, uh, there are advantages to it. Uh, sure, and we are still taking we still are are uh, taking advantage of those of those uh, of those advantages uh, of those um, steps forward. But it was always also destructive, and I think it's uh, it's important that we recognize uh, both sides of this. Now, I know that um, you know listening to um, Elon Musk and many others um, talk about AI will be great for society, but AI can also be destructive in half the workforce, they're gonna be unemployed. And is it inevitable? I think it is inevitable. That's why he's saying, we need, he's, he didn't say we need to stop, he said, we need to slow down. So yes, um, you know, it, did America benefit? This, this is gonna be my opinion. Did America benefit? Yes. Does civilization, or in, and when I mean by civilization, you know, we're talking, you know, I can 
I'm in an air conditioned home. If I need food, I can <laughs> I can go to a, I can go to a grocery store. You know, I I remember talking to a, a girl that was saying we all need to stay home and not and not you know during the pandemic. And I said. I said, okay, how are you going to get your food? And, you know, we got into a philosophical debate about how, you, how are you going to get your food? We're no longer hunter-gatherers. You're not, we're not growing food. So, um, but, you know, in my opinion, in my opinion, I, I do believe that anytime you're going to have any type of, of, um, uh, of development, you're going to have a clash. And the unfortunate thing, and, and we've seen this in, in throughout world history, the inevitable the inevitable can destroy quite a bit, and that that is an unfortunate thing that comes with it. Yeah, you're, well, you're you're right. I think I think a more productive question would be: Could we have could we have imagined better? Imagine a way uh, to uh, to to take advantage of and, and to promote the kinds of technological changes that we, we all enjoy, uh, and and other physical changes that were going on in the West, and still allow for a greater cultural independence, a greater uh, kind of a, a accommodation with native peoples, native cultures, native, native, native civilizations. Uh, I think in some cases we could have. Some places it would have been very difficult to see how it could happen. But there were places in the West, you know, where I think we could have found, we could have, uh, uh, we could have imagined our way to, to a, a, uh, a kinder, uh, you know, a, a more tolerant, Accommodation between uh, between these various peoples without to just sort of running them over like like a steamroller. Let me ask you on 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 that statement because looking at it, it's like yes, uh, on on paper you can you can say okay we can make accommodations here 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 and here. Um, this may be a little bit more difficult. That may be a little bit more difficult. And this may be a question that you may not be able to answer, but. Has has there ever been moments in history where that takes place? You're talking about Western history now. Well, you could say Western civilization history, not so much like I'm not. And that's why I'm saying you may not be able to answer because now I'm getting out of the scope of the Western expansion of America. But has that ever happened uh, before? Well, okay, let, let's look. Let, let's look at the West as, as, as a as a case study of this. Uh, as I said a, a moment ago, I think there were I think there were places and times when I I find it personally very difficult to imagine a uh, a true accommodation of, of ways of life. That is uh, the Great Plains, for example. It's very hard for me to, uh, to see how the hunter gatherer peoples of the plains uh, would be able to accommodate would be able to live uh, with an accommodation with the kind of uh, Rapid development of ranching and of agriculture and of, and of uh, trans, uh, trans, uh, transportation across the place. On the other hand, uh, I've, uh, I've uh, studied and written on uh, Indian relations in the in the Pacific Northwest, specifically with the Nez, the Nez Perce people of uh, Idaho and Oregon. Um, they were beautifully adapted to what was going on. There was not that great of a demand for their land. Uh, they, in many ways, were better off financially than the white uh, peoples who were settling around them. They they become very accomplished horsemen and and cattlemen. Uh, uh, they had uh, they were in very sophisticated business arrangements with the uh, with uh, with those around them uh, and with the government. They were getting along perfectly well, uh, and yet, uh, especially in the wake of the um, Sioux War of 1876 and the Custer disaster. The government simply moved in and said, uh, "No, you've got to, you've got to uh, get off your, leave your land. You've got to be confined to reservations. So we've got to, uh, we've got to uh, send settlers into this area." Uh, uh, I can't, I cannot imagine why we had to do that, but we did. Uh, we, uh, we simply failed to understand, failed to imagine our way into a way in which we would have this greater combination. So. It varies across across the West. You know, different different uh, West is an extraordinary varied place with many different circumstances. Um, uh, but there were places I think where that could have that could have worked out. Um, and the failure to do that to me is is uh, is kind of an American tragedy. Right. Yeah. And I I think we can agree on on that on that fact. Uh, an American tragedy among numerous American tragedies uh, over the course of our history. Um, I, I wanted to get off a little bit, um, 
from the from the tragic aspect uh, and move into something that I, I found fast I personally found fascinating, um, which was the rise of geology, the study of geology um, and paleontology. Um, you had uh, a few guys that just come off the top of my head from your book, O.C. Marsh and Bill Reed. Um, can you give us a like a little bit of you know how the rise of geology and paleontology came about in in America? I just found that fascinating. Well, I think uh, first of all, uh, the more general point is that uh, one of the things that I learned, and I've been I've been studying the West now for fifty years, uh, but what I what I learned in this was that the the American West was arguably the most active and productive scientific laboratory in many different fields during these years uh, on Earth. Uh, and there were many examples of this. But uh, as you said, uh, geology and paleontology were, were maybe the, uh, the, best, the best example of this. The, uh, the work of geologists, especially in the Southwest, uh, in Colorado Basin, John Wesley Powell and others like that, uh, simply uh, uh, reconfigured our understanding of what's, what's called both structural and historical geology. And one of the most important points that they, that they emphasized was just how unimaginably old the earth is. You know, what, they, what they did is give this incredible depth, you know, chronological depth to the, uh, to the story of the earth, you know, the oldest story in the world. Now, why is that so important? That's critically important because uh, geology and also, as I'll say in a moment, paleontology addressed directly uh, the most controversial, the most heated argument of the day, which was, of course, Charles Darwin's ideas of evolution through, through natural selection. Uh, Darwin's theory of natural selection required this extraordinary depth of time for this, you know, for, evo for evolution to occur. And the geologist said, uh, yeah, you know, we have that, there is that depth. Yes, there was time for this to happen. Paleontology, which of course is the, uh, is the search for uh, ancient life through fossils. Uh, paleontology in turn addressed uh, Darwin's ideas by, by, uh, by showing you know, examples of how life has evolved over time. Uh, sort of think of the links in a chain. And O.C. Marsh, uh, Othin O.C. Marsh, who was a professor of paleontology at Yale, uh, provided the first um, example, the first example of uh, showing how an animal, looking, using fossils, uh, showing how an animal developed from 50 million years ago to the uh, to the present. In this case, it was the horse. Uh, by studying uh, specifically horse toes and hooves uh, over time, in the fossil record, uh, he he just illustrated, you know, how in this case, this arguably, except for the bison, maybe the most uh, <laughs> the most iconic Western animal, or the horse. Uh, using the horse as an example, he showed uh, how Darwin Darwin was correct. Uh, it was really just irrefutable. Marsh also uh, demonstrated another of, of Darwin's ideas. Darwin said, you know, because every species evolves from another species and those branch off in this kind of a, you know, a, it's a, think of it sort of like a, a great bush, right? <laughs> All these different uh, branching off from one from one beginning. Um, everything's, always, everything's ultimately related to everything else. Uh, and this includes uh, examples of very seemingly very different species uh, being uh, cousins. Bears and whales, for example, <laughs> Darwin said, are related. Marsh showed, uh, in fact, an example of that uh, when he found a, a, a large six foot long uh, toothed bird <laughs> uh, called Hesperarnus regalis, um, the royal bird of the West. Um, and he showed through this bird how this bird quite clearly showed that both avians, both birds, and reptiles, you know, evolved from the same the same origin. So, um, again, Marsh showed you know uh, uh, how Darwin's idea of, of natural selections, in, in fact, uh, was was provable uh, through the through the fossil record. So, with both geology and paleontology, then what we see in the West is this uh, illustration of uh, uh, of how this most uh, this most volatile idea of the day. Uh, was in fact correct. It was a great breakthrough, and Darwin recognized this. He said that Marsh's uh, work was the most important work in his theory since that he wrote uh, after since he wrote uh, Origin of Species in uh, 1849. 
yeah, I, I, I got to experience people that I had never heard about uh, before. Uh, so it was it, it led to uh, even more research uh, from from your book into, you know, looking into these these individuals, I thought was uh, fascinating. Um, now, I, I got I got one last question. Alan, do you have anything? No, no, this is um, I, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying this conversation, and uh, I, I know what you're about to ask, so I, I am, uh, I, I'm going to throw in something here real quick before you go to your question. I don't agree with everything the Bible says, so take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Well, I mean, when, when, when you, you know, like any time anytime I've, I've read a book, I will always, I'll always come across, you know, a section of the book where I'll be like, well, you know, I might disagree with, you know, like the, you know, the part about, you know, any relations outside of marriage. But, you know, that's, that's another discussion we can talk about some other time. But uh, anyway, yeah. That's your personal opinion, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, Reading, reading your book, um, there are so many moving parts. Uh, and I think, you know, we were, we were talking about a second ago about accommodations um, and then ways of like, you know, there are some things that you just couldn't accommodate for. And I think obviously the primary problem is people. Like you have, you know, going back to the gold rush where you have this – one, not just the promise of land, but the potential for mass wealth. And when you have opportunity meets greed, you lead into a definite, and I know we've thrown out, we've thrown out the word inevitable about 10 times. Um, and I know that we, we shouldn't do that. I was listening to Andrew Roberts uh, the other night, the historian who does primarily uh, British history, but he was saying that a, a historian friend of his says, at no point in time in history is anything inevitable except a German counterattack. That's the only time that something is inevitable. So, um, yeah, so inevitable is probably an overused term on, on our part, for sure. Um, but your, your book was just so fascinating as far as like all the moving parts and you sort of, um, you don't make amends, um, for what takes place, but it, it, it helps, it helps make sense of the good, the bad, and the ugly to, to, to use a famous phrase. But I, at the end of your book, I, I, I wanted to bring up something that I found sort of perplexing. Um, at the end of your book to me. And I, I want to bring a quote out uh, to sort of bring my point across. Uh, so you write, when the two ways of life came together, one almost always would have to give way. This was the essential story of conquest. Cut through the smug rhetoric, the racist presumptions, and the patriotic goo, and what remained was the collision of two cultural worlds that in their material particulars and how they made their homes and fed their children could only rarely occupy the same space. I found that when I, I, I highlighted it, I thought it was so succinct, a very succinct historical, historical conclusion of your book. Uh, especially in terms of the collision between those two worlds, the whites and the Indians. But on the third page, the third to final page of your book, you spend about two to three paragraphs making what seems to me a political statement. And I was wondering why you chose to do that. What was the statement? <laughs> The, the, the two, par two or three paragraphs, it starts trying to tie in and you bring it into sort of almost the modern era and then in today's terms where you, you start tying in the, the Nazis and then you tie in uh, recent things taking place in the U.S. I was wondering because it felt like it for me, after reading the whole, the whole thing, it felt uncharacteristic of what you had just put 450 pages on. Well, I think the passage you're talking about, I was talking about uh, the um, uh, one of the ways in which the emergence of the West prefigures are, are uh, is critical to understanding the course of American history in, in the 20th century. Uh, one of the things that happens uh, in 
with the birth of the West is that we uh, are expanding greatly sort of the embrace, the comprehension of what we think of as the American family. Uh, it's during these years, it begins with uh, bringing Indian peoples into the nation, Hispanic people into the nation. In the Civil War, of course, it was emancipation with four million uh, enslaved uh, African Americans um, beginning their course towards citizenship. So there's this huge, there's this huge uh, expansion of uh, who we consider part of the American polity, political and social and cultural uh, family of, of this. Uh, what also happens there, um, as this expansion uh, of the family takes, the growth of the family takes place, is there is always uh, resistance to it. Uh, uh, resistance uh, can be violent, obviously. Uh, it can also be sort of ideological. So one of the things that happens here is the, the rise of what's called race science, or really kind of a pseudoscience, you know, that there are these fundamental racial differences uh, among peoples. Specifically, in this case, the, uh, the argument that there are uh, races are different, like species are different. That is, they have different origins. Uh, you know, a, a, a Caucasian. Is, is different from an Indian person uh, in the same way, in the same way, you know, that, that a horse is different, it's horse is different from a giraffe, you know, they're just different species. Um, now that's, of course, been long been debunked, uh, but that idea is there and, and it arises out of this expansion and this resistance to expansion of these, of, of different peoples coming into the country. And what I do in that passage you're talking about, as I said, this, this idea, which is sort of really born in the American School of Anthropology, but then is is taken up by others elsewhere, including uh, National Socialism, you know, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, and uh, sort of the race theorists of of uh, of the, among the Nazis. They, they specifically look back to the United States during these years as sort of a guide of what to do. So, I was simply making that 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 historical tra that transition uh, or or that connection uh, with those books. Um, it's political. Of course, it's a political statement. You know, if you if you if you raise the question of race relations and raise the question of, of uh, you know our relations uh, uh, with with Nazi Germany, sure, it's it's inherently political. I just I just saw I think the American I think the connection between here and there um, is historically provable. It's it's uh, many historians have said the same, and I just wanted to put I was trying to put this question, uh, the resistance or the, or the conflict that arises out of the, the uh, out of these events in the West in a larger in a larger context. In this case, international context. Interesting, Alan. Uh, any other thoughts, man? Well, no. I um I I was gonna say you know this is uh, I'll I'm gonna I'm gonna state it in that um you know and this is why i mentioned uh about the the bible and in some other books where i may i may come to some disagreements or i may come to um some other conclusions in terms of i, I understood why that was mentioned um i what i i didn't see and i and i may have missed it i i know that throughout history that you know this has been this has been an indictment on humanity more so than you know, we, the United States did not have a monopoly on the things that took place here. You know, the slavery, the racism, um, the genocide. Um, you know, and I know Hitler also mentioned Genghis Khan. Well, you know, we don't, no one is, uh, you know, Genghis Khan is not looked at as some sort of a monster right now. He's looked at as a great historical figure. So, you know, I, for me personally, for me personally, because there's so much, uh, resentment uh, with some of the students, the Generation Z, especially towards the birth of the United States and our history. That was the one thing that I did find a little concerning, because w when not taken into context, or when folks, fo young folks especially, when they read this little tidbit, they're going to automatically think, wow, America, horrible, horrible history. But then they don't know what the Mongols did. They don't know what the Persians did. They don't know what the African that the Africans enslaved their own people first before they even sold them to the West. Um, so that was. I mean, what are you? What are your thoughts on on that? That without knowing the full history of the whole world and that this is how humanity has been, and we have matured and we have, you know, I, I think we're like the only country in the world that has actually conquered countries like Germany and Japan. But, you know, we didn't, we ended up not 
treating them like conquered people, but we treated them like, okay, y'all had a bad government. Now we're going to ch change a few things so that you can join the rest of the world. Well, what are your thoughts on that one? Well, of, co of course, uh, it's, it's absolutely critical. I think one of the crises in our country right now is that we're that uh, the history is not being taught enough and it's not being taught in a large enough context. Uh, but absolutely central to that is the understanding that you've got to look at both the good and the bad. Uh, you're right, Alan. If if, uh, if a student chooses to read those two you know, two paragraphs uh, near near the end of the book, uh, that student might come away with the idea uh, that you know that this uh, that uh, this is a, a, a terrible country. There's you know that they, they, uh, we're guilty of crimes against humanity. If that student takes the time to read the two or three paragraphs before those those and the, and after that and looks at the whole story, I think that student will come away with a very different idea. Uh, there were enormous benefits uh, that came out of uh, the birth of the West uh, in terms of American uh, power and prestige, in terms of the productivity of this economy, in, in terms, like you said earlier, of the of, of the kind of a material life that we have to, that we have today. There were also terrible costs to that. Uh, as, as I, I think you're trying the point you're trying to make is it's that's always the case. You know, I don't care. Where you're looking, you're going to find you're going to find uh, you're going to find that it's 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 being human. You know, hist history is a story of what people have done over time, and people have done horrible things and they've done magnificent things. Um, you've got to just somehow figure out a way to try to keep to try to keep those in balance, and that's certainly the case, I think, in what I've tried to what I've tried to write about and to portray in this in this book. So. It's almost like the German counterattack. The good and the bad is inevitable. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well, that's true. But the one, the one thing you know, as I said earlier, we, we try to avoid using it's uh, inevitable. Uh, one thing is inevitable that is change, right? <laughs> change. Well, what is inevitable is uh, is people acting like people, right? right. People are people. Uh, yeah, I didn't, that's, I didn't, uh, I didn't that's the way people. To... That's the way people behave. I, I didn't want to uh, take away, you know, or, or you walk away thinking I, I didn't like. No, I, I loved your book. It's it's a fascinating read. It's a, it's a wonderful read. Uh, but you know, like I said, even even I have had arguments with preachers and priests about things in the Bible, and I'll be like, you know, I don't like that part. So you know, let's can I just do eighty percent? So, but no, fasc well, you know, uh, fascinating uh, book. Thank you. Uh, disagreement and argument is is that's how historians work. You know, that's how we learn things. That's how we uh, we come to balanced opinions. So I think the um, as long as we can argue and disagree, we're in, we're in great shape. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, one hundred percent. I can't agree more, um, ladies and gentlemen. The book is Continental Reckoning: uh, The American West and the Age of Expansion. It, like you may want to. Well, here's the thing. Here's what's lucky about about me and Alan is we get the, um, the uncorrected proof. So I feel free to mark it up and highlight it. If I had the, the hardback cover, obviously I, I would want to keep it pristine. Uh, so I'm lucky. So I'm not going to say go buy it and then mark it up, but take notes. You will be introduced to so many people and moments like the Rocky mountain locust. That was wild to me. Um, you'll be introducing to so many interesting aspects of the American West and you'll see the American West, um, as something like you've never seen it before. And I got to ask a question. My last one, uh, Elliot, at the top of the book, it says history of the American West series. What does that mean? Is this an ongoing series? It's an ongoing series. This is, uh, the University of Nebraska press, um, uh, has a series. It's, uh, it's edited by Richard Epelain. Um, it's been many years uh, in the works. It's just about completed right now. Uh, the earliest uh, earliest in the series by Colin Calloway, a very fine book called One Vast Winter Count. That's a history of Native peoples uh, prior to the coming of Europeans. Uh, the book by Anne Hyde, the one preceding mine in this in this series. Brilliant book. Uh, uh, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Sarah Deutsch, Sally Deutsch, her book uh, on the early 20th century has just come out. Uh, John Finley, his book uh, is on from World War II to the present. 
So the idea is that when you add, put all these together and you put them together, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty, it'll, it's a very sh uh, a sagging shelf of, <laughs> of paper, a lot, lot to read. But when you add all that together, uh, hopefully you will have a, an idea of the, uh, of, the, of the deep history of the American West up until the present. Well, Elliot, thank you so much for being on the Sons of History podcast. We've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for taking all of our questions um, uh, of, of the various kinds and, and putting up with our overusage of the word inevitable. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's our inevitability is to use the word inevitable because I inevitably use it uh, too often. Yeah, you've been you've been a you've been a good sport. So thank you. We uh, lo love talking to you. So great. Uh, uh, hugely enjoyed it myself. Always uh, great, uh, great questions. Uh, you clearly read the book carefully, and I appreciate uh, appreciate it all. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. So Dustin, I have a question. Um, you saw the movie Titanic. Yeah. Okay. Great movie. Great movie. All right. But there was that one part where I was like, why did you throw the necklace into the water? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's I hope he got that, you know, like yeah, worth worth watching. I'd love 99 percent of the movie. But there was that one percent. I'm like going, why? So, yeah, I, I hope he understood. I loved his book. Ninety nine percent. I loved it. There was that one percent. I'm like going. Okay, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm glad we got to ask him. I'm glad we we uh, we got to talk to him about it. Uh, like I said, it's a great read, great history. Um, yeah, um, and 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 I'm I'm in the same boat as you. That was, I was like I was being very very honest. I I loved reading the book. It is, he's a great writer. And obviously a great historian, because there's no way you get all of these individual stories into that book without knowing your SHIT. Like you, uh, like it's it's a phenomenal piece of work. It is, but that was my one, that was my one issue with it. Really, was tying in at the, at the very end. And like I like I said in in the question, I, I I just thought it was uncharacteristic of of the book, but I don't I don't want to belabor the point. I just think it's I just don't think it's a good idea um, in any way, shape, or form to try to tie um, America to the Holocaust. And like I said, in any way, shape, or form, um, I, I I think it's. And he said, if the student will read the whole book, let's just say that. You and I know, and he, he made mention of this. He made mention that history is not being taught correctly. It's not being taught in its entirety. Kids are walking away not understanding history at all. They're getting a very skewed, propagandistic view of history, which is, um, which is the Nazis are like, that is one of the primary points of of history now is everything is tying back to the nazis and if that's the one thing that students are definitely taking away from their history classes and that is the preeminent the the the, the pivotal whatever the the peak of of evil i just think i'm like dude can you tie you know tie it to something else i i don't know I, maybe I'm maybe I'm making the wrong argument, but I just I just don't think that it was a I just don't think it was a good idea. Well, you know the um, and 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 I think that was you know brought up in this book is is that you know the the West had to be tamed, um, and he meant he alluded to the fact or he mentioned to the fact that you know could there have been a better way? Yeah, there 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 could have been a better way. I know. I, I know that in terms of the conflict between the um, the the West, the, the the colonists that came in, the Americans, uh, when they had the conflict with with the, uh, the let's just call I'm just going to call them Indians. Okay, so you had the you had the uh, whites and you had the Indians. Um, that there was a movement to to Christianize the Indians. There was a movement to have them adopt or adapt the 
the ways of Western civilization um, in terms of of, of the of the way the land was was worked rather than you know and he said yes that they did have they did have a civilization um it was different than the white civilization you know so there was i in my opinion the inevitable clash there was going to be an inevitable clash because there were a lot of people coming into this country from western europe and central europe um at some point it, it the the two were just not going to work together, but there there was a, I'm you know there was a better way. There was the road, the 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 road systems that we have, the railroad, the the bridges, you know, and that's one of the things that I mentioned to him was that you know, yeah, uh, you know, when w- during the Revolutionary War, for instance, or even some time after that, you couldn't go from. Uh, the East Coast to, let's say, Texas or to California. The, you know, we had the Pony Express for crying out loud. You know, then then we got the railroad. We had the telegraph. And, and there was just improvements that there was an attempt to get everybody, all the natives, all the Indians, uh, to get them on board to live this way. I, I'm not saying it was done correctly. I'm not going to get into that. You know, I wasn't there. I can only go by what the voices of the people who were and there was atrocities on both sides and it led to hatred on both sides and it led to genocide and it led to some really bad things so i will leave it at that but you know i'm not the one that cleared the brush and cleared um i'm not the ones who built the tunnels going through mountains so that we could have transportation through from the East Coast to the West Coast. I'm not the one that that killed off the, or dried up the swamps and created land. I benefited from those people, which is why I, I have a tough time criticizing them. Yeah, and I think Elliot does a great job of discussing that in the book. It, it's it, it reminds me of what Thomas Sowell always says, is like, there are no solutions, there are trade-offs. And he does give due um, credit to those who did come before us and created all of these things, put their lives literally on the line, died uh, crossing over or just doing the hard labor. Um, and, you know, he, he, he gives credit to, to all of those people, whether it was, you know, the whites or the free blacks or, or the Chinese um, he, he gives credit to, to all of those. So it's a, it's a book that, um, he has done his due diligence and he is, uh, he has done right by so many. And then also points out, as he said during the interview, the American tragedy of, of which there are obviously, uh, many. And I think that goes with, with any nation, uh, especially any empire, um, is you're going to have uh, tragedies. You're going to have a number of tragedies, but it is, it's trade-offs and yeah, could could it have been done differently? Absolutely. It could have. Uh, there are so many ways to to go about it, and you know, it's like well, you just you live with it, and you try not to forget, as we mentioned earlier, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You got it. You got to tell the story of of all of it, which I think this book, uh, which I think this book does a good job of doing. So, um, anyways, yeah, that's that's all I got. Um, you got anything else, man? No, just. Um... You know, uh, again, you know, enjoyed the conversation. I, I, I recommend. I recommend this book. I know you do too. Um, so it, it's it's a good read, and you you learn a lot. There's there's so much there's so much material in this book to read. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, that's all I got for you, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you haven't yet, please do us a favor and subscribe. That is the end of our show. We will see you next week. It is already going to be May uh, by the time our next episode comes out. I cannot believe it. Uh, no, I take that back. This is May. I think this comes out May 1st, I want to yeah, say. Yeah, it does. It does. Even this though we're not insane, recording but... on May the 1st, it comes out on May. Yeah, day. now this is what, the 29th or something like that? Yeah. Um, but no, this is this is wild. Uh, so May is our final month of the fifth season. So if you haven't, uh, catch up, ladies and gentlemen. We will talk to you later. Have a great week.